my name is Phil Johnson, and uh, this is my testimony. I grew up in a, a church that was theologically liberal, and uh, the first time I really was aware of this was about the time I was in junior high school. I would suppose I was about 14 or 15 years old. We had a Sunday school teacher who would take the opportunity in Sunday school every week to uh, tell us why we shouldn't take the Bible very seriously. She, For example, uh, the, the Sunday I particularly remember that this became a problem for me. She was dealing with the story of uh, how Christ healed the man with the withered hand. She said, now, we're not supposed to assume that this was a real miracle. This is a moral tale. And what's important here is the morality in the story, not the actual miracle itself. This didn't happen. And uh, I remember saying, you know, you tell us that every week that we shouldn't take this passage seriously or we shouldn't understand this Bible story literally. And my question is, why do we come to Sunday school every week to talk about it then? Well, I'd rather be home watching the the pregame show for Sunday sports. And uh, she thought I was just being a smart aleck, but I, it was a sincere question. It may have sounded smart alecky. I, I usually do, but uh, I didn't intend to be a smart aleck. But anyway, she told the pastor that I had said that. And so he summoned me to his office midweek. He called me up on a Tuesday and said, can you come by my office? We need to have a talk. And so I went over to the church and uh, sat in the pastor's office. And he said, now, I I heard you said this in Sunday school, that you wonder why we even come to Sunday school. You'd rather be home watching sports on TV. And I said, that's right. She tells us every week that we shouldn't take these stories seriously. And, And she doesn't believe any of the miracles in the Bible actually happened. And he said, well, she's right about that. These are, these are like parables. They're, they're fables. They're stories that teach us lessons, but we're not supposed to believe they really happen. He said, for example, you don't, you don't really think Moses parted the Red Sea. It's impossible for water to stand up and, and have dry land under, underneath. That couldn't happen. And I said, well, that's okay. You know, kind of the definition of a miracle. I was only 14, 15 years old, and he had a doctorate in divinity. And so I began to ask him about the few miracles that I knew about in Scripture, Jonah and the fish and, and things like that. And he explained them all away. And he said, for example, the man with the withered hand, because that was a story we were studying in Sunday school. He said, this man had probably heard Jesus teach, if your right hand offends you, cut it off. And he had a problem with stealing or some sin that he committed with his right hand. And so he bound his hand to his side. He knew that Jesus didn't literally mean cut it off. So he just wrapped it up and, and stopped using it. And Jesus forgave him for his sin and told him he could unwrap his hand and use it again. And that's how he healed the man with a withered hand. Well, as a 14-year-old, I heard that and I thought, uh oh. Okay, that's not entirely unreasonable, but then I said, what do you do? And I, and I named some other miracles that I could think of. There weren't very many, and he explained them all away. And, and I realized this, this pastor doesn't even believe the Bible is true. And on my way home that day, I thought, I wish I'd asked him about the resurrection of Christ, because I, I knew from what he had told me, he, he didn't believe that either. But I also knew that if he told the congregation he preached to every Sunday that he didn't believe Christ really rose from the dead, we'd all stay home and watch sports on Sunday. And so that's what I began to do for the next year and a half. Never went to church again, never really thought seriously about the Bible. But that, in turn, made me aware of a great spiritual void in my heart and my life. I was into politics and human wisdom philosophy and i thought if i just make myself as refined and smart and sophisticated as possible then if there is a god he'll accept me because i've made myself a good person and that was that became more or less my religion for the next year and a half but i had a friend who had no interest in god and never shown any any uh you know spiritual dimension in his life or thoughts ever uh, and over the weekend during Easter break, he found salvation in Christ, and he came back to school after the, our Easter break, and he was a totally different person. And I remember thinking, whatever happened to him is significant, and it's not something I've ever seen or experienced. And that sort of set me on a quest to see if 
maybe I had abandoned God too easily, too quickly. And uh, I, I remember lying in my bed one night, unable to sleep and thinking, you know, what if there is truth in the Bible? I never really read any of the Bible uh, because I'd grown up in this liberal church. I heard Bible stories in Sunday school, and and I would occasionally randomly choose a verse of Scripture and read it and think that's Bible reading, and that's all I knew what to do. So I opened the Bible at random, and it opened to the first page of 1 Corinthians. By now, I'm 17 years old, so... I'm a 17-year-old looking for some spiritual meaning in my life. First Corinthians is not where you'd typically send a 17-year-old boy to find the gospel. But I opened my Bible at random. It opened to that first page of First Corinthians, and I'd never read a whole book of Scripture. So I thought, what if I read the whole book of First Corinthians? And I counted the pages to make sure it wasn't too long before I committed myself to do that. And it was longer than I wished it would have been, but I decided to go ahead and read. And those first three chapters of 1 Corinthians absolutely demolished me, because this is the Apostle Paul attacking human wisdom. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, he says. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. Uh, that's First Corinthians three eighteen. By the time I got to that passage, uh, I was just devastated because I thought, if there is a God, He'll accept me because of my wisdom and my human goodness and all. Then here He's saying the even the wisdom of this world, the best things in this world, are foolishness with Him. And uh, uh, He goes on to say, if if you want to be wise, you need to become a fool. And so I kept reading. I didn't know what to do or how to respond to that. But by the time I got to 1 Corinthians 12, uh, and, and some of that was very confusing for me as a, as a totally uninitiated, non-Christian 17-year-old. Uh, that's where Paul deals with speaking in tongues and some other things like that. Uh, but at the beginning of chapter 12, he, he's saying to the Corinthians, here's how you can detect whether someone is speaking by the Spirit of God or by a different spirit. He says, whoever confesses that Jesus is Lord is speaking by the Holy Spirit, and, and whoever does not confess Jesus is Lord is not. And I, I didn't fully understand the context or the, the, the immediate meaning of that, but I, I, it was enough to let me know that, look, Jesus is Lord, and unless I yield to him as Lord and believe in him, uh, I, I, there's no hope for me. And so I prayed, Lord, lead me out of the unbelief and confusion that I am in and, and, and bring me to salvation in Christ. And uh, some, a series of very strange things happened that very week. In fact, the next day I decided, look, I, I can't understand what I'm reading in Scripture fully, so I need a maybe a better translation, a, a, an easier translation. So I went to the bookshop to get a better translation, a more modern translation of Scripture. And as I was on my way there, uh, a fellow stopped me, and he was handing out gospel tracts. Nobody in my life had ever given me a gospel. It was a tract that explained justification by faith, the doctrine of justification by faith, that Christ's righteousness, his, the perfection of his holy life, is imputed to the person who simply believes in him. A, a profound truth, and really the basis for explaining how people are saved by the gospel, simply by believing, not by what they do, but by what they believe, what they what they embrace with their hearts. And uh, and uh, as I'm marveling over that, the phone rang, and it was a uh, an acquaintance of mine. I call him a friend. He, we weren't unfriendly, but it wasn't somebody I knew really well. He said, uh, Phil, listen, I go to this church, and we're sponsoring a citywide evangelistic crusade, series of meetings at the fairground. Uh, and he says, I, I, I'm required, you know, been challenged at my church to invite one guest to go with me. And, and I thought of you. And I thought, immediately I thought, oh, he chose me because he figures I'm a friend he can afford to lose. We weren't, weren't that close. But to his surprise, I said, yes, I'd love to go. I'd like to go. So I went with him to this evangelistic crusade, and the preacher, this was Friday night of that very week, uh, the preacher opened the Bible and began to preach from 
the book of Isaiah, which uh, despite my biblical illiteracy, I understood that Isaiah was from the Old Testament, that this was written centuries before the time of Christ, and this pastor was preaching from Isaiah 53 about the crucifixion of Christ. And uh, as the first time I ever realized that even the Old Testament prophesied that Christ would come and die for sins and be resurrected, he preached all of that out of Isaiah 53. And uh, I, I remember I didn't bring a Bible to that. I didn't, didn't know enough spiritually to bring a Bible to a meeting with a preacher. And, but my friend had a Bible open on his lap, and he was kind of looking around not using it. So I just took the Bible off his lap and thumbed through it till I found the book of Isaiah and the passage the pastor was preaching from. And I realized this is in the Old Testament. Why did nobody ever tell me that Christ's death on the cross was prophesied centuries before it happened? From that time till today, I've never had a doubt about the inspiration of Scripture because— uh, it, it's just so clear that this was the plan of God for Christ to die for sins. And uh, so I believed. Anyway, to make a very long story of my life short, I spent the next few weeks looking for a church to join. Uh, found one not far from my house. It was a Baptist church, and uh, I remember visiting in the morning and trying to sort of sneak out of there without anybody knowing me or accosting me, because I was just experimenting, looking for a church where they would open the Bible and preach it. And this guy did that, so I liked it and thought, I'll come back to this church, but I really wasn't in a mood to to uh, meet a lot of people. But the pastor saw me leaving by one door, and so he came over and, and, and grabbed me. I think it was... Uh, unusual to have a high school student visit this church. And uh, he said, uh, he introduced himself and said, Dave, welcome. Thanks for coming. Who are you? And I, I said, look, I'm a new Christian. I just became a believer a few weeks ago, and I'm looking for a church in the area where they actually believe the Bible. And he said, well, you found one. He said, and tonight we're having a baptismal service. And if you uh, haven't been baptized, I want you to come and we'll baptize you. And so I did. Now, the first time I visited that church, they uh, they had me back that evening to be baptized. And uh, in the in the course of that, he wanted to hear my testimony. So I told him how I had come to believe in Christ and what a new Christian I was. And uh, uh, he said, "What are you going to do with your life now? What are you? What are your plans? You're about to graduate from high school. What are you going to do?" I said, "But I, I need to study the Bible. I'd love to do that." I said, "Are there Christian colleges where you can?" learn the Bible while you get a college degree, and he recommended several of them, and the last one he named was Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, and I'd heard of it. It's the only one of the schools he named that I'd ever even heard of, and I said, is that a good school? He said, that's where I graduated from, and I said, that's where I'm going to go, and it was, it was, you know, that simple for me to make that decision. I sent away for an application, enrolled at Moody Bible Institute, started about a year later there, uh, and earned my bachelor's degree, at the end of which uh, my intention was then to go to seminary and, and study to be a pastor, but uh, I, uh, I needed to spend a few years working to earn enough money to pay for seminary, and so I took a part-time job at Moody Press, a publisher, the publisher associated with Moody Bible Institute, and uh, began to work there and discovered I had a a real ability with words and writing and editing. They they uh, hired me as a proofreader and uh, promoted me to be an editor within a couple of months after that. And uh, and so I stayed on there for a few years and worked as an editor. And that's where I met John MacArthur. He came to speak at Moody Bible Institute, and I'd never heard of him or heard him. And uh, after hearing him speak. I, I thought, this man should be writing books. He, he needs an editor. And uh, uh, that was th that sort of became my, my wish, that I could spend my life editing books for someone like John MacArthur. Uh, within a few years, Moody was doing his books, and so I jumped on the opportunity to edit those and work with John. And uh, he liked my work, apparently. And uh, uh, after, after we'd been... Working together on a book project for about a year, he said to me one day, you should just quit your job and come to work for me. And I said, okay. And uh, it was, again, that, that simple to make that decision. And uh, that's what brought me to California. That was in 1983. 
and I've been there ever since. So 36 years I've been uh, living in California, working with John MacArthur, editing his books, and in the process of that, in the providence of God, I've also had opportunities to preach and do some writing of my own, and uh, um, so that's how I got from where I was to where I am today. That's my life story in just a few minutes, and and uh, I thank God for the providence that led me from where I was and kept me from where I could have been and brought me to where I am today. And uh, and if you've heard this and, and you're not a believer and you're interested in uh, – what happens after we die? What do you do to have a right standing with God? Um, the message I would give you is the same one that I heard from Isaiah 53, that Christ died for our sins, that we like sheep have gone astray. We're guilty of sins. He wasn't. He was perfect. But Isaiah says, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He took our sins and paid the penalty for them in full. And in return, the perfect righteousness of his sinless life is imputed to us. It's credited to our account as if we merited that, even though we didn't. And on those grounds, we stand before God, fully accepted by him, united spiritually with Christ. And on that basis, and that basis alone, we have eternal life. It's not because of anything good we do, it's because of what Christ has done for us. That's what sets Christianity apart from every other religion. Every religion that humanity invents is all about what you must do to be right with God. Christianity and the gospel is a message about what God has done to give us a right standing with him. So my prayer for you is that you will trust Christ and love him as I do. 